It's time to get the breakdown started. One, two, three, three. First up, 10 observations. And just boom, just put it right on the ground. It's first and 10. So you would expect me to come out of the gates today just destroying a football team that continuously cannot do the basic simple things right in the biggest situations. Uh, and, and thus they are losing and they will probably continue to lose because these problems, while fixable in theory, don't seem to be fixable based off the current coaching and playing personnel. You'd be wrong, though. I'm going to start with something positive because I think it's very appropriate. Number one. Number one is that Sam Howell is playing excellent football. And if we all agree which most of us do, all reasonable, rational people do, that the most important thing for the rest of the season is figuring out if Sam Howell is definitively worth being your starting quarterback in 2024 and, in theory, beyond, then yesterday was an excellent day at the office. Was it actually an excellent day in a micro world? Absolutely not. And we're going to get there. Basically, the other nine things are bad. Some of them are really bad. Some of them are the reasons why many of the people that we're going to talk about won't be here in that future that very much looks like it is going to involve Sam Howell. However, Sam Howell is playing excellent ball right now, and he is perhaps the biggest reason they are competitive right now. I I know that sounds crazy, but maybe it doesn't. Like, he's their quarterback. It should be uh, an, an outsized influence on the game. But, like, this is crazy that a guy in, like, his 10th career start is out there balling above uh, what everyone else around him is doing in surely suboptimal situations based off play calling, based off offensive line performance, based on the fact that yesterday his star receivers couldn't get open. It seemed like if their life depended on it. And, in fact, much of the year their separation numbers have not been very good. They're good contested catch guys, at least 17 is. Um, so you throw it to him anyway. But they... Like, Sam is is fixing the things that need to be fixed, which is the most important thing from a development standpoint, and he's continuing to do the stuff that's incredible, which includes making big plays in crunch time, whether that is legitimate, like, there's 50 seconds left or whatever it was when he threw the touchdown to De'Ami Brown, or a, a third down here or whatever there. The moment is never too big for him, and that trait is the thing that has me so excited about him moving forward because he just has it. Like, whatever it is, Sam Howell has it. And they haven't had a quarterback who's had it in a long time. Alex Smith had a version of it. But his it was kind of all he had. Um, he didn't have a lot of else going on. And obviously, his career here gets cut tragically short uh, with what happened to him uh, from an injury standpoint. Kirk Cousins had it, but was also had some other things that was like a three quarters it. And that quarter was occasionally very important during his time here. I think he's grown out of some of those things in Minnesota, but that's another show for another time. Sam Howell seems to have all of it. It mentally, it physically, it a feel for things. Like I am continuously very impressed with Sam. The only reason why I'm not like, this guy's going to be a top 10 quarterback for the next number of years is because that's impossible to say. Like, it sure looks like CJ Stroud's going to be one of those guys, but we've seen guys go hot before and be good for 10, 12 games. I mean, shoot, Geno Smith had an awesome year last year, and now he's back to being more or less the Geno Smith he was for a lot of his career, um, certainly after he left New York. So I think the the excitement is 100% warranted. I think if you're looking at what Sam's putting on tape, there's nothing uh, that would, or there's very few things uh, that I see feasible happening the next couple of weeks that are going to change my mind unless he stops doing the things that he's doing right now. More specifically, the thing that I think is most encouraging about his de- growth and development, God, I just used the Ron Rivera phrase and I feel terrible about it, about his growth and or his development, there, I've made it my own, is that he has quelled the biggest concern. And it was a legitimate concern. He was getting sacked at an all-time rate, and it was his fault. Sack-to-pressure ratio is a quarterback stat. And you want to know how I know that? Because the pressures have actually not changed that much since earlier in the season, where this O-line is playing extraordinarily average uh, at best. But 
he has dropped his sack uh, to pressure percentage from 39% to this particular week was 13%. That is a very good number. So every time he's taken a, a pressure, it used to be over one third of the time he was getting sacked. Now those are turning into scrambles to, to big plays off schedule, such as the touchdown of Brian Robinson. He's finding subtle ways to move. He's getting the ball out faster. It's like, oh, I'm under pressure. Let's take a three-step drop and get the ball out instead of taking this five-step drop and getting smashed in the face. This is big-time stuff to make such rapid improvement on relatively quickly. And this is why, despite all of the rest of the nine things that I am about to go to through, starting with the defense next, yesterday, in the most macro sense biggest of pictures was a phenomenal day for the Washington Commanders. And now the poopy part. Number two. This defense does not have good enough football players on it. And so again, I'm going to do a micro macro thing here. And I, I please, before you freak out at what I'm about to say, listen for the micro and the macro. Micro yesterday contained in one game. I actually thought Jack Del Rio called a pretty good game. I thought the game plan was solid, and I think he made a really important adjustment during. Seattle has been abysmal, abominable, terrible, literally one of the worst five in the league at sustaining drives all season. I think I heard on the broadcast yesterday, they had more 10-plus play drives in yesterday's game than they did the entire season combined before that. If not, it was very, very close. That is how bad Seattle has been which, of course, is a bad reflection of the Washington defense, but as a plan, like, hey, let's make them drive the field, that was a good plan by Jack Del Rio. Unfortunately, his players could not execute. They couldn't finish plays. They couldn't generate turnovers. They couldn't get pressures. They couldn't do the things they needed to do to get off the field. So what did Jack do as we got into the second half? He started to pick up the pressure a little bit, and you saw it have an effect on Geno Smith getting the ball out. Like, okay, our back end can't stand up and cover for three seconds, and our pass rush isn't getting home uh, with what we need it to do. Okay, well, let's speed up this process a little bit. And it worked. Unfortunately for Jack... Percy Butler, I don't think, is a true starting caliber safety at this point in his career. He's incredibly, he's an incredible athlete. I think he is getting better, but you're just going to have one to two plays a game that are catastrophic, and it's the nature of the position that you play as a safety. If you miss a tackle, and especially in the run game or on a quick check down, you're dead. You're the safety. You're the last line of defense. You can't miss tackles the way he misses tackles. Like, even if you miss a tackle but you slow a guy down, that's something. Percy's whiffed a couple of weeks in a row on these 64-yard touchdowns by running backs from Andre Stevenson and then Walker yesterday. He's not good enough to be a high-caliber NFL starter at this point in his career. Benjamin St. Juice is a solid NFL football player, but he is not a number one corner. And that's an important distinction, right? Like, I'm not going to be radio hot take guy like, Benjamin St. Juice stinks. I'll leave that for you guys in the YouTube comments and on Twitter replies and such where he is getting absolutely destroyed today. But here's the thing. Is it Benjamin St. Juice's fault that he's Benjamin St. Juice? Or is it the organization's fault for continuing to ask Benjamin St. Juice to go one-on-one with DK Metcalf and AJ Brown and the best receivers in the league and he's not up to that task? organizationally, they are setting him up to fail. He is failing. He could be better. But I think what you have to realize is like Benjamin St. Just is very solid in in terms of getting into a lot of good positions, but he doesn't always play with the technique that he's asked to, and he's not a good finisher. And that is just blatantly clear. He had no interceptions in college. He has the one that Desmond Ritter threw to him this year. He is not a finisher. And you can't be not a finisher and play number one receivers in this league. So it's not that he's a terrible, no good, unplayable, not actual NFL corner, as he's not any of those things as a number one corner. So you're outmanned. David Mayo, same concept. Is David Mayo an unplayable, terrible football player? No. And actually yesterday, he had a lot of really good plays. Played well against the run, had some nice plays in the flat. Like he's a very sure tackler most of the time. But he's David Mayo, and he's being asked to start. He's way out leveraged as a starter. It's too much exposure. And eventually, as a starter, as a middle linebacker in this league, you're going to have to cover 
a number three receiver in space. He can't do it. And so what you have here is players that are not good enough to be in the positions they're being asked to be in, but there's no alternatives, which is why on a micro level yesterday, Jack, good initial game plan, good adjustment, don't have the horses. The problem for Del Rio and also Rivera is that they picked the horses. They picked these guys and put them in those positions. So it is a macro, big picture, terrible reflection of them, which is why they won't be here next year. But within the game yesterday, I thought they set up up the players as well as they possibly could have. The players need to freaking play better. But also, if they need to play better every week, I have to have questions about how you teach and how you coach so that you get rid of this inconsistency from a guy like St. Juice. Why is it the same stuff every week? Eventually, that is also a reflection of the coach and the, the people that picked him, the coach, the general manager, the scouts, etc. That is my spiel on the defense and where I think it is. That said, I think the offense could have helped them out yesterday. Number three. If your defense does not have the horses and you know this, your offense needs to help them out. Did the offense do enough to win yesterday? Maybe, but not with this defense. And that's something that they can control. And this is where I think your head coach has to step in. And I, Ron Rivera admitted today, he's not willing to do that because he is putting Sam Howell's development over the team. That is a topic we are going to circle back to for sure. Those are not Rivera's words directly, but they almost are. You can't hold a team defensively to 4 of 14 on third down and lose time of possession. And that's exactly what Washington did yesterday. Their defense actually held Seattle to 4 of 14 on third down, which is very good. Unfortunately, they gave up a ton of first downs uh, on first and second down, so that's a little bit misleading. But if you do that, if you're able to get the team, the opposing team, off the field enough that it's 4 of 14 on third down, then you need to be able to hold the ball and convert on offense enough to make that where you're holding the ball for a majority of the game. And it wasn't a huge discrepancy. It was like 30, 45 seconds. But like, what are we doing? And where did it go wrong? And I think that Eric Bieniemy's unwillingness to run the football is the cause here of this. Obviously, that's actually not that insightful or brilliant of analysis, but it has this larger global impact on the game because when at least you run, let's say you have an incompletion versus a run for no gain. What's the difference? In a run for no gain, the clock keeps running. And if you have an incompletion, the clock stops. So on top of all the other things, making it harder for your quarterback to be successful, making your offensive line pass block a ton, putting extra decisions on your quarterback, um, the schematic advantages of when a team has to respect the fact that you're going to run it. Like all that stuff goes out the window. You also have the realistic, you know, uh, trickle down of the defense has to play way more snaps. They played 80 snaps yesterday. That's Eric Bieniemy's fault. Is not as much as Jack Del Rio's or as much as the defensive players, but like it is partly Eric Bieniemy's fault. And so I'll, I'll go. Actually, I'm gonna reorder my my chart here. Number four. It's not about for the offense scoring more. It's about not being so bad when you're bad. So, like, the scoring drives, good. The point production, solid. But can you not go three and out as often? Can you go five and out? Can you go seven and out? Like, can you convert one or two first downs to give your defense a blow? To shorten the game down a little bit? To to change field position? And the, the, the where did it go wrong? The crux of my complaints with the commander's offense yesterday are the final three drives of the first half, which in total are nine plays from scrimmage, 12 if you count the punts, which I will mention that because I also did the math in terms of time of possession, uh, which counts the punts. Four minutes, eight seconds, over three drives. So that is a minute and 30-ish a drive. No first downs. And what is the play call discrepancy on that? Why is this so important? Why is this so illustrative? 
Because on those three drives where you go three and out, three and out, three and out, it is eight passes to one run. The final drive is only 53 seconds long. That is why the the Seahawks are running so many plays. That is why, even though you give up nine points uh, in the first half, and we'll get to part of the reason why it was only nine in a second, uh, but nine points in the first half, and your defense just completely collapses in the fourth quarter because they're dog-ass tired. It matters. And the whole history of football seems to prove this. You, You do score with the passing game, but you can win games by sprinkling in enough of a run, uh, or a run threat, that you keep the schematic advantages of balance and that you play complementary enough football with field position and with time of possession that you don't put as much pressure on your defense. And I think that Eric Bieniemy has failed the commander's defense miserably in that regard this year, and I don't think it's necessarily in the top three to four reasons, perhaps even, that the defense is bad, but... It certainly is not helping. And if you're Ron Rivera and you're the head coach and you're supposed to have a global view of this, it'd be really nice if you said, hey, man, we got to run the football a little bit. Those guys are dying. Just a thought. Continuing on. Number five. Back to the defense. The situational execution is just awful in this game. And the end of both halves is brutal. And that is, unfortunately, par for the course for this team. The Seahawks are, or excuse me, the Commanders are giving up more points at the end of the first half than any other team on the year, a trend that would have continued if Geno Smith hadn't lost his mind on the final play where he intentional grounds on uh, a play with seven seconds left and they run out the clock. That is a drive that is upheld, thanks in large part, to a first down by penalty by John Allen. And was there any doubt in the world that they were going to give up the final field goal drive? No. That just the fact that we all know it is the point. I don't need to get much deeper than that. The fact that we all know it is the point. When you gotta have it, they don't have it. And that is the sign of a bad defense. Number six. Also a sign of a bad defense. Defensive penalties killed them yesterday. Man. Uh, five of the six accepted penalties from the commanders were on the defensive side of the ball. And I mentioned the Allen play. You also have uh, BSJ uh, having the, the pass interference late. That's a killer. They followed up with 12 men on the field. It's like super key situations that you are screwing up and giving uh, first downs by penalty. There's four of them yesterday. And the, uh, the third one, or the other one, uh, obviously, Emmanuel Forbes, uh, unnecessary roughness penalty. We'll get there in a second. Um, but you just can't you can't give away drives like that. Um, that's a, again, is Eric Bieniemy the biggest reason that they they give up eighty plays yesterday? Uh, no, he's a contributing factor. Maybe the biggest reason uh, is the penalties because you just extend drives for free for the offense. Can't happen. Can't win with it. And um, unfortunately, I think it was worse yesterday than it has been, but is not necessarily a new. Phenomenon. All right, a couple quick hitters to wrap this up. Number seven. I love that they're using the screen game more. I don't get why there's so many tight end screens to John Bates. Bates is a fine football player. He's a great backup tight end that is a reliable blocker and can do a little bit in the pass game. He's not the guy that I'm drawing up screens for on a team with this many weapons. Number eight. Cameron Cheeseman, bad snaps. And I'm not going to lie, there's a small sadistic part of me that wanted that game to come down to a commander's game-winning field goal where there was a bad snap and it bit Rivera in the ass because he didn't take care of it in the preseason. The bad snaps were back. He said after the game, you know, they were good when it mattered. Sure. But I hope that Cameron Cheeseman takes what some exorbitant part of his salary and buy something nice for Tress Way because Tress has saved his bacon a ton this year. Number nine. I thought about the two-point conversion more uh, at the end. I still would have gone for it. I'm curious to know what the numbers say, but I do think it's not quite as obvious as I thought at the time. The reason being, uh, well, I was like, I cannot believe Rivera's not going for it at the time. The reason is this. If you play for overtime and you get a three and out situation or a quick stop, now, of course, no matter what, you need to get the stop. Um, And I would rather have it. If we get the stop, boys, we win the game. 
right? If you convert, obviously, if you don't convert, well, then you've already lost the game and the stop doesn't matter. But if you kick the PAT, you make it excellent, good, love that. Uh, you now get three stops in a row or three downs in a row. The, the offense is probably going to punt it or maybe even after first and second down, if it's a third and 14, you get a sack, whatever. They might just take a knee and go to overtime as opposed to going forward and fourth down, going all out, trying to make it. That is a risk I would have still taken at that point in the game. However, it's not as indefensible as I felt at the time because of the timeout situation. Obviously, what is indefensible is the way the defense played, making all of that somewhat irrelevant. Number 10. Also indefensible is the absolutely absurd explanation and the decision in the first place to eject Emmanuel Forbes. To say that he wasn't making a play on the ball is lying to our face. He did it very poorly, and it absolutely deserved an unnecessary roughness penalty. But to eject a player because there's incidental helmet-to-helmet contact is a joke. And the league should be embarrassed, and they should come out today and say we screwed up. And the fact that that came from New York, where you have a professional referee sitting watching a slow-motion replay is embarrassing and i'm tired of referees who are paid lots of money to sit in a room and watch a television screen lie to our faces about what is happening on our television screens that is first and 10 we start the show with 10 observations every single monday here following the commander's game in this case a loss 29 26 to the seahawks of course my first reaction always comes instantaneously that is with logan paulson on take command you will hear what we said uh, about this one and why logan has his eyes on the offense uh, not the defense next on the team 980 hey this is da and you're listening to the hoffman show on the team 980 and the odyssey app. 